Hi, I'm Kempi Chalunsuk, and today we have the pleasure of speaking with three distinguished members of the Miami Design Preservation League. They are Bill Farkas, Maddie Bauer, and Betty Gutierrez. Well, let's get started. Um, tell me, Art Deco District, how was the district form? What saved it from demolition and all these big buildings that are up now? Well, that's a long story. Uh, I hope you have a lot of time. Um, it started way back in 1976 when one day Barbara Kaepernick came around with Leonard Horowitz and she was on a tour vacation and um, she saw all the buildings in Ocean Drive and Washington Avenue and on all of South Beach and she got very excited about what she had found and uh, she started to get people together and actually teaching the people and passing her vision to other people that were in the neighborhood at the time. Uh, that's how it really started. Leonard Horowitz was a great uh, designer and he, with Barbara, saw these buildings uh, in pastel colors to get the detail of the buildings um, to show more because uh, they, you couldn't really see them when they were painted all one color. And that's how it really started. Uh, she formed uh, the Miami Design Preservation League, and um, that's in 76, and just it grew and it grew and it grew and it grew uh, into what you see today. But it was really a small group of people with a lot of vision that created the uh, Art Deco District. Speaking about the pastel colors that you mentioned before, how did these buildings get the world-renowned pastel colors? And was it the colors that made the district come alive? Uh, I think it was the colors. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. But, but it's a funny story. Oh, yeah. Well, then tell the funny story. Uh, and stories. you guys know it. Uh, Leonard Horowitz was a genius in terms of colors and design, and he was Barbara's sidekick. But the original colors are not the Leonard Horowitz colors. The original colors were, if you recall, pretty much, pretty much that beigey browny stuff, but they did use color on trims, eyebrows, arches. Leonard developed this great feeling for what I call the ice cream cone colors, put it on a couple of buildings as a test, got it on the cover of the foremost architectural magazine in the United States. And then this television director, what was his name? Michael Mann, remember? Miami Vice wow. fell in love with the same colors. And that's what made Art Deco in color. It was all over the world real fast, thanks to the uh, Miami Vice oh, show. Yes, and, and, and the building was the bakery. That was his thing, and 7th and Washington, that I always think should be painted that way and create, which I don't know that you can do, but create that like a landmark. The fact that that building with those colors created a controversy. Uh, some people thought it was ugly, and some people just love it, and it became the, the talk of the town. Look at that building. Either some people, it's like art, you know, some people like certain type of art. This became the art, and, uh, and I think that we lose here in Miami Beach by not following through to get that building painted that way and make it the landmark of the starting of the pastel colors and the district. How did the district transform into an economic engine? That took a long time to happen. Uh, really? Who was influential with that? The Actually, Barbara's son, Andrew Capitman, was uh, one of the first ones to purchase the buildings. He believed in that. The Preservation League did a study plan exactly of how things would take place and how you could develop that economic plan. So Andrew got a few investors together and purchased uh, several properties. The Cardozo was one of them, the Carlisle, and a few other properties. and. He was the first wave and he suffered the economic impact with his investors, but you always need the first wave. And um, then what happened was that the Miami Design Preservation League, to concentrate on the development effort, formed the Miami Beach uh, Development uh, Corporation, now the Miami Beach Community Development Corporation. And they were the ones that really 
concentrated on the economic development and they held several symposiums. They brought in um, developers from uh, mostly the Northeast, New York, Baltimore, DC, and actually that wave is really the one that is actually still here. They, they were, they're considered the uh, pioneers of this economic impact, which is Tony Goldman, who owns the Park Central, Saul Gross, who's now a city commissioner and, and a realtor and owns several properties here, Mel, Mel Slesser, Slesser. And uh, there's a few others that, that really have an... Um, the Robbins, Craig, and uh, there, there was a few that, that bought into the vision and, and really were the pioneers, like she said. But I think the Miami Beach Development Corporation also had a great imp uh, impact uh, because through the Miami Beach Development Corporation, Leonard Harrowick picked a, a block in Washington Avenue and design the colors in a home block. And the Miami Beach Development Corporation started to get grants from the federal government and to do facade renovation. And it went out into the community to sell the vision of what it could happen if the block was developed. And we actually did the first one. Lynn Bernstein uh, was the person working with the the Miami Beach Development Corporation at the time that was the one doing the facade renovation. She now works in the city and, um, uh, and she sold the first person and there was a grant thing. They gave him $5,000 if they did, you know, the, the renovation. Mm -hmm. And so when the people, it was the, the impact that it had in the community when they saw two or three facades of stores next to each other it was the impact was enormous and then people started to even the the people that weren't real big developers they started to to try to do it because it looked so beautiful you know what as I look back you know what really helped us and it's a crazy thing because it's 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 not very positive but the fact that we never got never got our act together uh, until all the other cities the New Yorks and the Chicago's and the LA's and the Philadelphia's were developed and their prices went sky high while our land prices, you could rent land, you could rent buildings, retail buildings for about two bucks a square foot as I recall, you could get a hotel room for 10, 15, 20 bucks a night. And the fact that our prices were so cheap I think helped attract the Tony Goldman's of this world and who was the Duke of Deco? Yeah, that, that bright Cuban developer who, Jerry who came, Sanchez. Jerry Sanchez, Jerry that's Sanchez. what he told me that. He says, you, yeah. compared, to, actually, compared to New York prices and to L.A. prices, he said, this is one hell of a bargain. Right. Right. Now, try and buy those bargains. They that's don't, right. now they're, now gone. No they're gone. They're gone. Well, you've attracted the developers. What attracts the tourists to the Art Deco district? One of a kind, I guess. Sun and beach first. There's no question about that. Well, what sets it apart from other tourist destinations? I think I think that it started with the beautiful people coming. You know, after after we started uh, renovating a few of the hotels, the the film industry, the photo shoots came down, and the beautiful people started to walk around uh, Miami Beach. And so what happened? It became like the cheap place to be, because. The fashion industry is very, uh, yeah, yeah, hip, and so, and so that's what happened. And people started to come in. I remember Tristo came in and did uh, way back when uh, the the Pink Islands, and he was one of the first ones that really came in and stayed in a hotel in in Ocean Drive, and the hotels weren't all fixed. But that's how it started. Then the film industry came in, and then it started to to the evolution of people coming in, and and then of course the nightclubs came.